It's going to be interesting today. Calvinism is insulting to God. I went four and a half, nearly five years to a Calvinist Bible college. I had uh, a Presbyterian professor, and I was taught the doctrines of Calvinism, and it never did make sense to me. I always had a problem with it because I had been evangelizing and uh, knew the scriptures and the word of God pretty good before I went to Bible college. And I didn't have the equipment to challenge them, so I learned and did real well in theology. And after I got out, I began to study. And when I really discovered what Calvinists believe, <laughs> I knew that it wasn't what the Bible taught. And it certainly wasn't what I believe. So we're going to talk about that a little bit today. Don't have time to do much, but Calvinism is Lutheranism. Now, why do we say that? Because Luther was before Calvin, and he's the one who wrote Bondage of the Will, and all Calvin did was formalize it in such a way and made it popularized it across Europe, so it's called Calvinism. Calvinism is Augustinianism. Luther, in his book Bondage of the Will, quotes Augustine on nearly every page, sometimes several times on a page. Uh, it's Greek and it's Roman fatalism. In other words, Augustine was schooled in the Greek and the Roman fatalism, and he syncretized and brought it over into his Christianity. It's heathen determinism, and it's the default position of fallen humanity. I used to minister to the military guys quite a bit, and every single one of them who'd never heard of God even, didn't know anything about God, came out of the depths of New York City or L.A., all of them were Calvinist. Now, they never heard of the name Calvin, but they all believe that what will be, will be. That uh, God foreordains all things, and they would say, you can't die till the bullet is fired that's got your name on it. Uh, that's a Calvinist position. And then Calvinism is insulting to God. Now, B.B. Warfield, back in the late 1800s, says the system of the doctrine taught by Calvin is just the Augustinianism common to the whole body of the reformers. Warfield admits that Calvinism is Augustinianism, which goes back to the late 300s and 400 AD. Now, John Calvin said, Augustine is so holy within me that if I wished to write a confession of my faith, I could do so with all fullness and satisfaction to myself out of his writings because Lutheranism and Calvinism are an expansion of Augustinianism. Now, Augustine, this is his picture, 4th century, was formally trained in Stoicism. You know what a Stoic is, right? The guy sits there and looks, <laughs> sit there and looks at you and uh, endures pain, endures suffering, knowing that he all is foreordained and nothing you can do about it. It's karma. In his early life, he believed that a meticulous, micromanaging God predetermines every detailed event in the universe. So Calvinism existed in the heathen world a long time before Augustine and Luther picked up on it. It is the default position of fallen humanity. In other words, leave it to a sinner or a devil, he's going to arrive at a Calvinistic position. He rejected the traditional view of election, that is, the view that the church had held for 350 years, replacing it with a predestination as necessity based upon faith. Now, don't have time to explain all this, but necessity means you necessarily sin and you necessarily go to hell because that's your fate to do so. Now, upon conversion, he syncretized Christian doctrine with determinism, mixed the two together. He wanted to justify his own heathen practices, and he saw Christianity as an advance over the heathen doctrine he'd been taught. According to Augustine of Hippo, everyone bears guilt which he incurs at birth and is in the bonds of inherited guilt. In other words, a baby is born guilty, blameworthy, and damnable. Augustine invented the concept that infants are baptized to remove Adam's original guilt. Now, that's why the Roman Catholic Church adopted it. That's where it came from. 
And that's why they called it Reformed Church. It was an attempt to reform in some measure Roman Catholicism and failed to go all the way. So he invented that concept of infant baptism. They baptized the infants so they could take away that original sin and guilt. And therefore the child stood on his own merit at that point rather than being damned based on what he'd inherited from Adam. Crazy stuff, man, I know. Augustine said they are punished not only on account of the sins which they add by their indulgence of their own will, but on account of the original sin, even if, as in the case of infants, they had added nothing to that original sin. In other words, a newborn baby have, having added nothing to Adam's original sin is nonetheless guilty and damned. They'd added nothing to that original sin. Now, this is my definition, my definite view on the question. So that the hidden things of God may keep their secrets without impairing my own faith. What he says is, his very doctrine would endanger his faith. <laughs> How could you have faith in something that crazy? But he says, it's a secret of God. I don't understand it. So therefore, I'm going to keep my faith and my understanding separate, lest my faith be in peril. When I was in Bible college, they told me, when you go out to your churches to preach, don't preach the doctrines of Calvinism straightforward and plainly. It'll scare the people off. Ease into it. And that's what they did. Now, Martin Luther came along 1483 to 1546. A lot of Christians around when he came along, but they're all being persecuted by the church that Martin Luther was a part of. So Martin Luther saw the light on justification by faith, and he says, For if a man has lost his freedom, which he believes he has, bondage of the will, that you have no free will, and is forced to serve sin and cannot will good, that conclusion, what conclusion can more justly be drawn concerning him than that he sins and wills evil necessarily. In other words, he's saying, since it's true that man has lost his freedom, and since it's true that man is forced to serve sin, and since it's true that man cannot will good, we have to conclude that a man sins and wills evil necessarily. He has to. He cannot do otherwise. That's his nature to do so. That's the condition God created him in. That's how he's born. Then Martin Luther says this, the creator directly energizes, controls all acts of his creatures. All events are necessitated by his will. That means when there's a shooting, it was God's design. When, there's, when children are kidnapped and used sexually, that's what God predetermined to happen. All things happen by necessity. When the person who is vile and chooses to abduct children for sexual purposes, they're doing it because God foreordained and elected them to do that very thing. It gets crazy, I know. It, I can understand why there are a lot of atheists out there when they read Christian doctrine that the Calvinists put out. Then he says, So the foreknowledge and omnipotence of God are diametrically opposed to our free will. Either God makes mistakes in his foreknowledge, and errors in his actions, which is impossible, or else we act and are caused to act according to his foreknowledge and action. So he's saying that God's foreknowledge somehow is the cause of all our acts. Now this is a modern Calvinist, Godwell Andrew Chan. He says, if man's will is not free, but is under God's sovereign control, this would necessarily lead the conclusion that God is the ultimate cause of evil. Now, when I first read that, I thought, okay, okay, he, he sees that and he's going to reject Calvinism. When he sees that Calvinism, the conclusion is that God is the ultimate cause of evil, he's going to reject that. He said, many find this idea very hard to swallow. Yes, yes, yes. Even many within reform circles find this idea that God is the cause of evil hard to swallow. Before I read Luther, before I read Calvin, I read Gordon Clark in Religion, Reason, and Revelation. Clark attributed the ultimate cause of evil to God. I was totally shocked when I read it. <laughs> he should have he read one of these books then. But his arguments were irrefutable. 
I thought it was a novel idea, at least until I read Luther and Calvin. Then I found that this was the position of the Reformation all along. Now, John Calvin said, Original sin, therefore, appears to be a hereditary depravity and corruption of our nature, diffused through all the parts of the soul, rendering us obnoxious to the divine wrath and producing in us those works which the Scriptures calls works of, works of the flesh, so forth. Now, Calvin said, concerning infants, he said this, <laughs> hold your seat. Some of you that are, go to Calvin churches won't want to go next Sunday. For although they have not yet produced the fruits of their own right, unrighteousness, children, they have the seed implanted in them. No, their whole nature is, as it were, a seedbed of sin, and therefore cannot but be odious and abominable to God. Can you believe that? According to Calvin, that infant is odious and abominable to God. You know, the one redeeming virtue of Calvinism is that the Calvinists don't believe it. <laughs> it's just a, I cannot, I cannot fathom what kind of pleasure they get out of espousing it when they don't really believe it. You show me the first Calvinist mother who receives her newborn infant, looks down into its face, and thinks you are odious and abominable to God. You are damnable. You are guilty. Shame on you. <laughs> I cannot conceive of a Calvinist mother ever doing that, can you? See, she doesn't believe it. She doesn't believe that doctrine. Jonathan Edwards, 1700s a Calvinist, said, The God that holds over the pit of hell, much as one holds a spider or some loathsome insect over the fire, abhors you and is dreadfully provoked. His wrath towards you burns like fire. That's what they think of infants as well. He looks upon you as worthy of nothing else but to be cast into the fire. He is of purer eyes than to behold than to bear to have you in his sight. You are 10,000 times more abominable in his eyes than the most hateful, venomous serpent is in ours. There's your congregation of Calvinist sinners, according to them. Those abominable souls, those damnable souls, who were foreordained to destruction. I hate to say it. So God could get glory. God made me for hell, says the sinner in hell, and he'd be right. And he'd have the best of all excuses. Jesus, on the other hand, said, Suffer little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Uh, is the kingdom of God like a bondable to something to despise? Is that what it is? He said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Hmm. Maybe Jesus never read Bondage of the Will. Maybe he didn't attend a Calvinist church. Maybe he didn't believe it at all. Maybe he thought that was a heathen practice going on in Rome and Greece and Athens at that time. Take heed that you despise not one of these little ones, for I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father, which is in heaven. So an infant dies, doesn't go to hell. He's in heaven, beholding the face of the Father. Uh, I haven't uh, got the time to go through all the scripture in this one. We'll do that. We're coming to that. Now, next, I'm going to show you the scriptures the Calvinists use. Now, if you disagree with any of this, be sure and write me a comment, and some of you can discuss it and throw it around a little bit, because uh, I'd like to see what you have to say. It will be real funny. So, in eternity past, God said, I'll create them to burn forever, and it will bring me glory. That's what a Calvinist believes. And a man looks up to heaven. God, was I created to go to heaven or to hell? Good question. The question is not, do I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, or can I be saved? The question is, am I elected or not? Charles Finney, Systematic Theology. You see, not all people have believed that. In fact, very few have. It's uh, more of a modern trend, and... Uh, Something came down with the uh, half Catholics. 
Men plead a sinful nature for the excuse. It would be a good one. And pray, what is this sinful nature? Do you mean by it that every faculty and even the very essence of your constitution were poisoned and made sinful in Adam? According to the Calvinist, yes. And came down in this polluted state by inheritance to you? According to the Calvinist, yes. Do you mean that you were so born in sin that the substance of your being is all saturated with it so that all the facilities or faculties of your constitution are themselves sin? According to the Calvinist, yes. Do you believe this? <laughs> if any if any really didn't think they could believe it. I admit that it if it were true, it would make out a hard case, a hard case indeed. Until the laws of my reason are changed, it would compel me to speak but openly and say, Lord, this is a hard case that thou shouldest make my nature itself a sinner and then cha charge the guilt of its sin upon me. God makes me a sinner and then blames me for it. I could not help saying this. The deep echoings of my inner being would proclaim it without ceasing, and the breaking of 10,000 thunderbolts over my head would not deter me from thinking and saying so. The reason God has given me would forever affirm it. But how strange a thing is this. If a man is in fault for his sinful nature, why not condemn man for having black or blue eyes? The fact is, sin never can consist in having a nature. I need to get my material on nature. Nor in what nature is, but only and alone in the bad use which we make of our nature. This is all. Our maker will never find fault with us for what he has himself done or made. Certainly not. He will not condemn us if we will only make a right use of our powers, of our intellect, our sensibilities, and our will. He never holds us responsible for our original nature. That's in 1800s. That's what Charles Finney, the theologian, said. So, verses the Calvinists used to support their heresy. Not now. Next time. In the meantime, we have a couple of books. I don't make any money on this. None at all. And this is called What Love Is This? by Dave Hunt. It's a really good book. And then before it was written this one, I think Dave Hunt used inspiration from Lawrence Vance, The Other Side of Calvinism. Now, I read this through carefully a couple times and marked it, and it's it's like you, you cannot believe. He quotes, 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 quotes the Calvinist, uh, hundreds of pages quoting the Calvinist, and then he gives corresponding responses from Scripture. So if you want something very thorough on the subject, either one of these books would do. Now, my book, Divine Design, goes in philosophically to the uh, human nature and how we arrived at it. Okay, I'm going to stop there. i got things to do, and you do too. So uh, next time we'll talk about uh, verses the Calvinists used to support their heresy. So long. <laughs>